Hi, this is Brenda with the psychodynamic frame of reference in 502 Applied Occupational Theory. And really with the psychodynamic frame of reference, we're looking at a group of frames of reference that look at psychoanalytic and ego adaptive approaches to helping people who have psychological barriers to occupational performance. So I'm hoping that by the end of today, you can have a rationale for why you might select this theory for use in practice, have ideas for how you would assess and build an intervention plan to meet the needs of a client with this theory, collaborate with others to determine a rationale for putting an OBM, an occupation-based model with this frame of reference, and then break these down um, and build up an assessment and intervention plan to meet the needs of a client. Sometimes emotional turmoil defies logic or scientific study. It just pours out of a person like passion. And sometimes we need a lens to examine that in occupational therapy. Psychodynamic frame of reference fills that need. So today I'm not going to exactly follow the textbook. There are two chapters in our 2020 Cole and Tofano textbook that deal with psychoanalytic and psychodynamic frames of reference. Um, what I want to do is first focus on occupational therapy theorists in this area, in this group of frames of reference, and then go into a little bit more detail on some of the terms that we're going to be examining. But some of the most important questions to ask ourselves as we're going through uh, the psychodynamic frames are what's behind what gives people meaning? What engages their passion in life? And as we're considering that as a frame of reference, what might be an occupation-based model that would give us a view of the occupational approaches to this person that would go well with the psychodynamic approach? Now, some of the psychodynamic um, theorists in occupational therapy include Betty Hasselkus, who talked about the world of everyday occupation and the meaning that's behind the occupations that people have and how they give people meaning and help them understand how they make a difference in the world. Now, Gail and Jay Fiddler, who um, published in 1954 and 1963, talked about how the unconscious mind communicates through activities. So they really delved into this psychological way of approaching occupational therapy. Anne Mosey in her three frames of reference in 1986 talked about the analytical frames of reference, which is the approach that the psychodynamic frames take. Looking at adapting intra-psychic content for more adaptive interaction with the environment. And then our book actually cites someone named Howard and Howard, which of course would be myself and my husband. And we talked about how in occupational therapy, spirituality is the experience of meaning. So that meaning aspect sort of ties into these psychological approaches. One approach specifically used by occupational therapists is the object relations approach. Now, the authors go kind of deep into discussing object relations. I'm not going to go as deep as them. The thing I want you to remember is that within the psychoanalytic frame of reference, in object relations, the person is working out their emotions by projecting these emotions onto an object or another person. This could be the case of using the occupational therapist as a blank slate for the client to uh, develop a relationship with them and the occupational therapist reflecting back to the client what they need. Um, so that, that therapeutic relationship building or making relationships with non-human objects. In other words, using expressive media to um, pour out those emotions and, and sort of get those emotions out where the person can see them and examine them and work with them and work through those difficult emotions. So it's sort of a way of putting the emotions outside oneself and examining them in a way that feels safe to the client. 
as sort of a subgenre of optic relations, we talk about attachment theory, which uh, the authors talk about it being mainly for pediatrics and um, helping people who uh, don't have that pos positive attachment to parents for whatever reason. Maybe they've had problems with early relationships with their parents, and this has brought the clients to therapy. The ego adaptive approach is an occupational therapist led approach uh, espoused by three theorists, Anne Mosey, Lila Lorenz, and Gail Fiddler. Lila Lorenz is the OT who actually coined the term ego adaptive approach. And she, you might remember her from uh, Black History Month. She is a Black occupational therapist theorist who has uh, really made a difference in occupational therapy. We'll talk about her again when we get to our segment on the lifespan approach. So trauma-informed care, which you may have heard of because it's um, quite popular right now, it takes this ego-adaptive approach that the ego can adapt. And some of the ways that it does that is through narrative storytelling and working on how one defines oneself. Uh, you can find references to this sort of an approach clear back with um, Mattingly in 1998 was the reference that I used where uh, she talks about how clients will see themselves as a victim or an agent. Do they see themselves as simply having to passively accept things that come to them or an agent of change, somebody who can make things happen for themselves? And so I really liked this quote from the textbook that says the ego is seen as a powerful motivating force that can either resist, that would be our victim, or facilitate, that would be our agent, therapeutic change. So we are not going to go into great detail about trauma-informed care and narrative approaches, but there's something that I just want you to be aware of. There's something that if you were going to use them in practice, you would need further training in order to use them. Our last slide talked about the ego adaptive approach, which begs the question, what do we mean by the ego? Well, this is a Freudian term. It goes all the way back to Freud in 1953. And we're gonna talk about defining the id, the ego, and the superego. The id, as you may remember from your intro to psychology class, is the part of the psyche that is unconscious. It is our primitive drives and instincts, our needs and our conflicts, and it is thought to operate through this primary process thinking. It's illogical, it's undisciplined. Our dreams use primary process thinking. So if you think of um, any, any kind of movie or, or TV show that you watched with a dream sequence that happens sort of unrealistically and alerts the person to something going on in their life, you can think of that as your example of what's going on in the id. The id tells us things without us thinking through them logically. The ego is the outward facing part of our psyche. And this part of our psyche function, functions logically. It works to balance those internal drives and the external expectations. It's thought to operate through secondary process thinking or these are ways that we learn to think through experience, we learn to compromise, uh, we learn to use discipline. If the id is our unconscious and the ego is outwardly facing, the superego is sort of the angel on our shoulder. The id would be the devil on our shoulder. So this is our social component that's always serving as our moral code. What would this look like if I carried it to its logical conclusion? It's illogical, but in a different way. It's more unrealistic, idealistic, and perfectionistic. Uh, I've heard this called our parent tapes, the things that we think of that our parents would be saying to us um, if we think we're behaving in a way that is quote unquote bad. So here's an example. If you think back to occupational adaptation and our toddler who wants a cookie, if we look at it from a psychodynamic perspective, the id is saying, I need the cookie. I must have the cookie. And the superego is saying, but mom says, no, I shouldn't have a cookie before lunch. And the ego says, how can I both get the cookie and not make mom mad? 
sort of balancing the id and the super ego. Freud made some assumptions on our use of psychic energy based on his observations. Freud said our psychic energy is limited and we have to share it between the id, the ego, and the superego. So we if we have too much energy placed in dealing with unresolved conflicts from the past, then the person is not going to be able to function because they don't have enough psychic energy to manage their day-to-day -day life, their outward-facing portion of themselves. So let's talk about these types of psychic energy. Libido is the good psychic energy. This is the one that is our sexual energy to perpetuate life, to be intimate, to love, to reproduce, also called the life force. Now, the libido exists in the id, and it seeks to express itself through objects. So if you, if this helps you remember it, if you think of Star Wars and Luke and Leia, who are actually siblings, and the type of positive energy that they bring to the screen, to the story, um, that would be a good example of libido. Um, so since we're talking about force, uh, hopefully the Star Wars analogy will help you remember this. Sticking with our Star Wars analogy, aggression is the death force. It's the, the negative side of the energy that we possess. So it's the Darth Vader, Kylo Ren energy. This is our hostility, our hatred, our urge to destroy but it helps us in positive ways to be self-sufficient and it helps protect ourselves um, and distance ourselves from others when we need to. This is also part of the id and it also seeks to express itself through objects. Now Freud says there's a need to control our energies, to control our libido and our aggressive drives. It's the ego that works to control both as far as how we behave socially and creating socially acceptable ways of expressing libido and aggression. Now, the superego is always looking at what's moral and trying to keep us within the bounds of what is socially constructed morality. Let's return to our toddler for an example of this. So if the toddler doesn't get a cookie, they might throw a temper tantrum. That would be that um, aggression, right? Now, a college student is going to find more socially appropriate ways of expressing their disappointment. In this case, the superego is going to say, you've got to control yourself in this particular situation. And so the ego might find more appropriate ways to express oneself. For example, telling someone about your disappointment or... Uh, listening to loud music or um, some other way of managing your frustration rather than throwing a temper tantrum. So where does anxiety come into this? Well, Freud says that anxiety is an alerting response that tells us that something is wrong and needs to be changed. And it basically comes out of our fear that the id is going to take over, that we're going to be taken over by those those um, uncontrolled passions um, that are in our unconscious. So Freud views anxiety as always pathological uh, and says that it's the ego acting to defend itself and it begins to put up these ego defense mechanisms. This is where you begin to see people act out. Um, and he also says that depression is the aggressive drive turned inward against oneself or the ego. So that ab aggressive drive can be turned toward ourselves in the form of depression. One of the things that we need to remember as we're continuing on in this lesson is that these are assumptions. These are terms and language that we're given to discuss things that are going on in the mind that we can't necessarily see what's going on in the mind, but we can see what comes out of the person as a result. So the ego we're talking about is the self. It's the self that we can see and deal with. On page 344, table 23-2, 
lists 12 functions of the ego. Now think of this as a list of terms that we can use in our documentation to describe what's going on inside the person and things that we can use to create goals. So that language can be very, very helpful to us. Now we've talked a little bit about how these different types of energies are expressed through objects. And this is a lot of where this object relations idea comes from in OT history. So the fiddlers uh, talked about these relationships with humans and non-humans and that we can focus on them within the therapeutic environment. And they said that symbolic and actual properties of objects help us to satisfy drives and needs. So I'm gonna give you an example. As I'm sitting here recording this lecture, my cat is here beside me and she's purring and you might even be able to hear her purr, I'm not sure. But that purring, that sound that she's making, I mean, it's just a biological function that cats do, but I'm assigning meaning to it. I'm saying, oh, she, look how happy she is sitting here beside me. She's very content. She wants to hear my voice as I'm talking to all of you. And the fact that she's here with me gives me sort of a little sense of social um, interaction going on while I'm recording this lecture with you. And that satisfies me, uh, satisfies my needs uh, for today as I'm sitting here recording for all of you. Now here's a list of terms that helps us to talk about ego adaptive, intervention or ego psychology. These are things that we can use to create interventions. They are easier to measure and observe than things that are within the id or the superego. So we can basically use these concepts to get at the things that the person is struggling with and also to create an intervention plan that is something that other people can understand because we're using words that other people can understand as well. Back to a little bit of background, you might remember from Intro to Psychology that Freud said that people can get stuck in any one of these stages of um, development um, for psychosexual stages, and that it's their um, getting stuck that is causing the sort of conflicts that they're experiencing. This is one way that has been used to talk about uh, the, the psychological problems that people have. So just wanted to, to remind you of this, um, that this is part of our background in this area, as well as um, Erickson's um, theories as well. So what does this have to do with us and occupational therapy? So let's start pulling this together a little bit. We're gonna spend a few slides talking about the psychodynamic assumptions about people that we have. One of the things that we assume is that people have both a conscious and an unconscious mind, and that sometimes our behavior is largely influenced by what's going on in the unconscious mind. If ever you doubted this, think about uh, your younger brother, you know, or, or somebody who would be like a younger brother to you, who can push your buttons and annoy you when you don't even know why it is you're reacting the way that you are. And after you go through whatever circumstance where they've just pushed your buttons again and you've gone off on them, and later you think about, now, why did I do that? That is not at all the way that I wanted to behave. We would say that's because of the unconscious mind, the id coming forward and causing you to act in ways that you did not intend. Another assumption is that sometimes we act in ways to gratify our needs, not necessarily needs that are within our conscious awareness. And we have this innate drive to achieve that gratification of our basic needs, especially making satisfactory relationships. Now, the first thing I thought of when I read this is, so that's why I ate the cookie that I didn't intend to eat when I was feeling stressed. There's something that's making me wanna gratify my needs. And that would be one way of looking at it from within a psychodynamic approach. You could also take that even farther. Why do people engage in substance abuse when they know that it's self-destructive? Well, it's somehow gratifying a need that isn't necessarily in the conscious awareness.
Our book talks a lot about the developmental approach that comes with the psychodynamic frames of reference. One way that you can look at that is that the infant is always striving to meet their needs and their sense of personal identity and integrity. And an infant gets great personal intrinsic satisfaction from finding ways to meet their needs. That's why infants get so excited when they start to crawl or walk because they get to do things that, that they had not been able to do before. And the thought is that we carry that sort of drive forward in our lives. Erickson with his psychosocial theory and Freud with his psychosexual theory both said that people need to develop in a sequence and that the more positively that a person is able to achieve each stage in the sequence, the better they're going to be able to reach their potential, the better they're going to know themselves, and they're going to be able to adapt as they grow. And this is all gained through interaction in the individual's culture and with the social environment. So one of the things this means for OT is that we're going to have to provide people experiences that allow them to grow in ways that help them achieve psychosocial achievement and uh, grow their ability to control themselves. Now, in the psychodynamic approach, all of them, in fact, OT is concerned with three dimensions, the intrapersonal, what's going on inside the person and how the person is relating to themselves, interpersonal, how the person is relating to other people, and activity aspects, how the person is relating to a chosen occupation, how one is using activity and occupation to express themselves and interact with the world. So within these approaches, we need to dive into the person's inner life, and we have to look at both the individual and their collective belief systems within their own culture. And these are used by the therapist then to understand the meaning that the client is assigning to the occupations in which they are engaging. Function within this class of frames of reference in the psychodynamic, psychoanalytic world basically comes down to having a strong sense of self. Being able to behave in ego adaptive ways is what the person needs in order to be able to function. Dysfunction is mainly a lack of ego skills. Now this could be a result of inadequate psychosexual or psychosocial development, conflicts and fixations that the persons might have or an imbalance of psychic energy. So for me, from a practical standpoint in the clinic, after talking about psychology, I'm always left with a little bit of a nebulous feeling like I'm not really sure what it is we're supposed to be doing after we talk about all these big concepts. So let's take a step back and look at this big picture of what it is we've learned about the psychodynamic frames of reference. Well, we've learned that the ego is the outward facing part of the person and functions of the ego can be evaluated and they can be developed. So we can help a person develop those ego skills that are gonna help them face society in ways that are functional for them. Within the psychodynamic frames, change is a result of insight. So that's very different from cognitive behavioral. In cognitive behavioral, you don't need insight, you just need behaviors. Here, the person needs to understand the reasons why the behaviors that they have. And by understanding, they can then reflect on their former behaviors, how they perceive them, maybe even change their perceptions of those past experiences and learn new ego skills that help them to go forward. Assessment within the psychodynamic frames specifically look at basically the person bringing emotions out of themselves 
and being able to examine them in a safe way. This especially might be looking at intrapsychic conflicts that are leading to inappropriate expression for this individual. So we're helping them examine those expressions in safe ways and consider why it is they're acting in those ways, getting that insight, and then beginning to think about how that person might move forward. There's not always a clear distinction between assessment and intervention. So for example, when we get to talking about the Kawa model, it actually uses a drawing of a river to consider what's going on in the person's life. And it's actually a very psychodynamic way of thinking of things as the person draws these boulders that are creating barriers for them. And so then we can begin to talk about how are we going to remove these boulders so that the person can begin to move forward again. So that distinction between assessment and intervention just kind of flows together. And within these psychodynamic frames, if the problem is the unconscious material, then what we're trying to do with intervention is to bring that material to the conscious mind in order to understand and resolve what's going on there. So we might be selecting activities for their symbolic potential. And this can be everything from artistic means to um, say bread baking, which involves a very physical connection to what the person is doing to dance and theater and other ways of bringing out this um, symbolism of what's going on in the person's life so that they can examine it in a safe way, develop ego adaptive skills and move forward. Again, this is a specialty area. So if this is something that you would want to go into, it would be something that you would need to study further in terms of the assessment and intervention techniques you would use in any specific setting. Goals look a little bit different in a psychodynamic setting because you're looking at identifying unconscious conflicts and fixations. You're writing goals about insight, gaining insight into behavior, beliefs, and values. You're also looking at specific ego skills, and you're looking for the person to develop and practice them. And those could be things like social skills. So after all that theoretical background, let's look at five useful areas for occupational therapy that come from these psychodynamic frames. So anything that we do that involves social participation and working with relationships comes from the psychodynamic frame. Anytime we're working at having the person express emotions in a safe and controlled way comes from the psychodynamic frames. Anytime we're looking at building self-awareness or self-efficacy, we are looking at this frame. If we are helping them work through um, appropriate and inappropriate defense mechanisms, if we are using projective arts and activities, these things are also from the psychodynamic frames. Just to help recap here, I've got a slide that has psychodynamic terms for you. These are things that I would expect you to at least be familiar with when we're talking about psychodynamic frames of reference. And here are psychodynamic tools that I would also want you to be aware of what these are, basically the types of interventions that occupational therapists and the interprofessional team might use. Now our book mentions trauma-informed care, but it doesn't go into great detail about it. So I've uh, left you a link here where you can explore that a little bit more. Again, I would just like you to be aware that it exists. We're not going to go into great detail about what it includes because it would be a specialty area that you would need further training on. Thank you very much for being with me today. Here are my references and we'll see you in class.